And thank you everyone for um, coming tonight. So uh, as Rachel introduced me, I'm Leslie Motla. I'm from Zipcar, I've been at Zipcar for uh, about five years. And uh, I head up uh, an organization that focuses on um, member experience and looking at the end-to-end -end member experience across all the interaction channels that we have, mobile, web, the car, phone, customer support. Uh, and I get a chance to work with cool and fun people like, like Todd, and I have uh, uh, Winston Wu here as well in the back. Uh, uh, so really fun, fun group to work with. Um, I have uh, about four things that I want to cover with you today. Um, the first is just look, taking a look at um, you know, why designing great, experience, great experiences matter. You know, um, what's, what's so important about that and, and how we think about that at Zipcar, at Zipcar. And then taking a look at what our core design principles are. Um, so just giving you a little bit of um, information on, on that. Um, and then we'll take a look at um, uh, ways in which you know, we've actually applied some of those design principles. And we'll also take a look at the overall complexity of Zipcar as a business. Um, as you may or may not know, there are a lot of moving parts, so it's an important aspect of our design um, um, processes to look at how complex the business is. So I think um, you may find that interesting. So first of all, uh, as I mentioned, you know, why does experience design matter at Zipcar? What's our, what's our mantra, our you know, centering philosophy? And we try to make it very simple, and that is that we believe great experiences drive loyalty, and loyalty fuels growth. And um, but, you know, we, we, if you look externally, you can actually find correlations and data that show um, certain companies like Apple, for example, where you can see that this model actually works. Um, and so we believe it's a very easy thing to communicate among our team as a centering um, principle. And it's easy for us to kind of tell this story in the organization as well so that People and other groups in the organization at Zipcar really get an understanding of what we're trying to achieve as an experience design group. And when I say loyalty, what I mean by that is really uh, you know, getting people to use your service over and over again, to really rely on it, uh, to use it more frequently, and to tell their friends about it. And so that's really what we're, we're striving for. So this is just a core mantra and um, centering principle of Zipcar. Next thing I want to talk about is just the complexity of Zipcar. I'm not sure that you can how well you can see this, but um, I call this a service system map. We all have different names for these kind of um, uh, diagrams, and it's a very high-level one that depicts all the moving parts of Zipcar. So the top layer is part of the member experience. So the steps that people are going through as they're using our cars on a daily basis or reserving the cars. Um, the, some of the supporting layers are all the touch points, the interaction points that we need to think about as we look at this end-to-end -end experience. So as I said, you know, it's the location, where we place our cars, uh, it's the car itself, it's the mobile device that is so central to people's lives right now and to our members' lives right now. Um, it's the phone and, and call center agent when, when you call us and you need help or assistant, assistance. And it's all the web and email properties as well. So whenever we're dissecting the experience, we need to, we're often thinking about all these different interaction channels. And then continuing on the complexity, we have on the operational side, you know, we have physical assets, right, that are moving around right now in many different cities across the globe with different types of drivers who have different types of skill levels and people are facing externalities like weather and traffic and all sorts of, uh, uh, of things. So we have those externalities as well as the physical assets. So we need to manage cars, we need to buy cars, cars, um, you know, we need to maintain cars. We have uh, member services operations. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about how things do go wrong, you can imagine, in car sharing. And so that's an important um, part of experience design to recover well and design um, uh, appropriately around that. And then we have external vendors as well that are, you know, helping us to manage this service system. 
And then, of course, the other layer is the data that we collect, the data we have, the tools that we're using, and the systems that we use. So, um, you know, this is, again, it's a high level depiction of the complexities that we're dealing with, but it's a good framework for us as we start to identify areas where we're going to redesign or new things that we're going to design. We typically need to peel it back and look at all of these different elements, not just the, the interactions that the external user is having. <clears throat> So just getting into um, the core principles that, that we follow as a, as a team and as a company. The first one uh, is very simple, you know, observe and understand people. Um, this is one of our core, core principles um, because, as you all know, you know, um, people can't always, you know, say what they want, um, but their behaviors will, you know, tell you and guide you um, with regards to what they do want. And so we really believe that this is an, an important um, guiding principle. And <clears throat> to give you an example of how we do that, this is, these are some pictures of, um, you know, we, we try to drive along with our members and, and kind of sit in the back and um, be quiet as a mouse and, you know, watch them getting lost and getting into traffic and all sorts of things. And this, is, this depicts someone in New York that we observed through some of this research where you can see um, up, up at the top the members waiting for the valet. So we need to think about things also on the geographic level because in New York, for example, our cars are often parked in garages, whereas in London they're parked on the street, so we have these we have these different um, dynamics that we need to deal with at the city level as well. Uh, in addition to city governments, things like that. So here, you know, he's waiting for the valet. So one of in our process, we would we would say, well, you know, he's paying for this reservation. Um, he's not going to want to wait for the valet. So how we how can we as a design group uh, design out that wait? For example, how can we make that um, pickup with a valet more instantaneous? So this just I won't go through each one, but it just gives you examples of you know us following this member along their journey from reserving the car to picking it up to finding the car to driving it to getting into really bad weather. Um, you know, to traffic and uh, to, to, to needing to um, extend his reservation. So by doing this, by really observing his experience, we can really break that down into stories that we want to address and design for, such as, you know, help me to manage externalities and variables that we can't predict, like traffic or weather. So help me, you know, manage, manage those variables. So observe and understand people is a uh, core principle. Um, and this is just you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a fun historic quote that really supports that, right? Um, that, that it, you know, Henry Ford, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, so the next principle that we follow is to dissect the, the journeys that um, are both our external customers have and our internal customers have. And so there's, there's a lot here, but at the top is another high level um, experience flow that our members go through. Uh, and so what we typically do is, and again, it's another framework that really centers us so that we can say, okay, we're gonna focus on, we know that there are challenges or we wanna redesign the reserve experience, for example, and, and we, we really dissect that particular area of the, of the um, experience flow at the top. And so really taking it by personas um, and dissecting you know, what happens with regards to different segments of, of the population um, and how they're using our, our service, doing the things like in-car ride-along um, that I mentioned, and also you know, getting people after uh, or before they interact with the service and understanding, you know, what we do some follow up questioning, you know, what were you thinking here when you knew you were going to not be able to return your car at the time you had originally selected. So, you know, di diving deeper into people's thought processes and understanding the different personas and segments of people that use our service. So dissecting journeys is another core principle for us. 
Um, the next one is designing internal experiences. As you saw, the business is very complex, and so what happens in the operational processes, what happens in the call center and between an agent, a call center agent and a customer is very you know, important, right? And so we want to make sure that we're designing great um, uh, experiences for our internal constituents as well. So these pictures just show, for example, um, the, one, uh, the one underneath is us observing member services agents while they're on the phone, filming, <laughs> filming them while they're on the phone, interacting with uh, a customer who may be having a you know, fairly serious issue like a, a, a breakdown or an accident or something like that. And so what we do as a, as a team working with the other functions in our, in our company is uh, we want to also, you know, design a great experience for those agents because the agent really wants to solve the problem fast. Uh, you know, make sure that the customer is um, satisfied with how that interaction goes. So not only do we dissect those, you know, external member journeys, but we do the same uh, on the operational level with groups like our call center agents and fleet operations and we think that that you know is very important because it, it's so foundational to the overall end-to-end -end experience that the members are having. <coughs> Conceptualize ideals uh, is another core principle. I don't know if you can see this but basically what we're trying to do here is we do try to let ourselves uh, think about you know a clean slate if we have a particular pain point or uh, something that we want to design out or something new that we're looking at designing. Um, one step we often take is to, to conceptualize, well, what's the ideal situation and let's sketch that out. Um, let's get scrappy about it. Let's not, we're not committing to anything, but let's really let ourselves think about what is the ideal experience look like. And, um, and then from that, really backcast into here we are today, how can we make progress towards that ideal? And so letting yourself you know, conceptualize ideals, uh, ideal experiences, I think is a, is a critical um, principle as well. Um, designing experiences and not features. Uh, Rachel mentioned the, um, the, the honk and unlock um, feature or, um, that, that we developed. And you know, what we try to do is say, okay, this, this is part of the beginning of the experience. It's, it's, the, it's the getting to my car experience. It's the unlock and lock experience. And we could have just said, okay, let's, let's create something that you know, unlocks and locks the car. Um, but by first doing that uh, observation of how people you know, start that experience with us and get to the car and how they currently use the zip card, that led us to, by looking at a more holistic experience, it led us to not only do the lock-unlock function, but also um, honking the horn, flashing lights, which helps people to actually find the car in situations where maybe they're not reserving the same car or um, um, you know, you're going to a new garage or something like that. So by, by looking more holistically at, at the experience versus saying we're going to develop this feature and starting at that point, we, I think, you know, created a richer experience flow for the customers. So design experiences, not features. So I want to just, um, so those are the core principles. Um, and I want to just give you a couple of examples uh, of the detail around how we've applied these um, principles. Um, the first is what we call the pickup experience. It's not, you know, it's the car sharing kind, not the bar room kind or anything. But um, so this is a critical component, right? You've reserved a car and, um, you know, you, you, you want to get the right car basically for your needs. And so really um, what we did here was we observe how, you know, people search for cars, how the decision making that people use around finding cars um, and realized that um, one thing that made sense is that people really wanted to see all the cars around them that may or may not be available whereas before we were simply showing just 
only the cars that are available right now because what we learned by observation is that people, there's a segment of people who will change their uh, trip details, you know, based on the fact that a car may be available in two hours. It's not available now, but it's available in two hours, and maybe, maybe I'll change my plans a little bit to go shopping in an hour or something like that. So, again, by observation uh, uh, around how people are searching for uh, a car, we, we then expanded, you know, the experience flow for, for the members using the, um, the iPhone app. And Winston's the guy who did it all back there. So, yeah, Winston. Um, <clears throat> so continuing on this particular area, and, and again, what I'm trying to show is this. It's complex because we're 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 um, looking at many different interaction points, and we're really really breaking it down. So continuing with the pickup experience, um, w you know, what we observed is that you know people want to get to the car that they've reserved quickly with no confusion. And as I mentioned, uh, in some cities, you know, cars are in garages and uh, not necessarily in locations that if you haven't been, you know, it's, if, if it's not the car you're using all the time, it may be a challenge to find. And so the team went out and observed people after they made reservations, observed, first of all, um, you know, what tools they were using or relying on to try to get to that vehicle. Uh, and so some of those were paper, you know, they printed out a, a piece of paper, a confirmation page. Um, so, we, so we tried to observe, you know, how people were, what decision-making process were they using and tools were they using to try to find the car. And again, just following them, basically. They let us, you know, they, they know we're following them. Uh, we, give, we give them driving credit and stuff, so we're not skulking in the background or anything. But um, <clears throat> so in this case, you can see at the top, uh, uh, you know, there, one of our cars is right there, but the signage is, you know, it's not, it doesn't, um, you know, pop out. He doesn't see it. Uh, he's looking at his paper. I think this, this gentleman had a really tough time finding the car. I think Winston was there. Um, exactly. So he went to four different garages before he finally figured out the car. So by, again, really observing how people find the cars and dissecting that, we're able to say, okay, how can we, the problems he had, how can we address those and, make, and, and you know, design, design out those problems. And so things, simple things like ensuring that we work with our fleet teams to make sure there's always a sign outside the garage. So first of all, you know you're at the right garage, right? Um, and that was one example. And then also looking at other tools that are accessible to people, adding location photos to the mobile app. Because again, a lot of our members, 94% of our members have smartphones. They're very reliant on the device, so at least making these visual cues available to them in that tool that they carry around with them is another way that we can just help them make sure that they're finding the car, getting into the car as quickly as possible so they can go accomplish their trip goals, which is what they really want to do. So that's um, the pickup experience, just some examples again of how we look at it holistically break it down and uh, design based on, you know, the, the different issues that are happening. And um, the next one, the last one, is, um, this is one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite Google alerts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember I was with the GM of Boston when he got it, too, and I was just like, Whoa. Um, Anyway, so as I mentioned, and as you can um, uh, imagine, uh, the, the, coming back to that complexity and the fact that there are so many moving pieces in this business, that things are going to happen. Things are as much, even as you know, as much design thinking that we do, things are going to happen, especially with people and cars and traffic and all that. And so, one very critical element uh, for us is service recovery and designing for really terrific service recovery. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with something that's called the service recovery paradox where if you recover well with someone in a negative situation, they're 10 times more likely to 
tell their friends about it and, and you know, say how great that experience was versus if nothing happened and they don't say anything. So you, know, you really, really want to think about uh, the, the things that may happen and make sure you're designing a really good experience when things go wrong. Uh, so this is a very critical area um, for us. And again, you know, looking at that, what did, what did we do here? How did we break, how do we break that down, the, the situation of, a, of an accident, for, for example, or a breakdown, car breakdown? Um, really understanding, first of all, what the member might be going through. You know, if you've been in an accident just in your own car, you know, it's an emotional um, situation. Uh, you're confused and, and so really understanding, okay, what's the state of the person who's calling, who, who this agent's going to be talking to. And by doing that, just designing simple things into that interaction where rather than the agent saying like, hey, is the car okay? You know, the agent says, <laughs> you know, the agent says, are you okay? Are you safe? And <laughs> So it's, it's, you know, it seems very simple, but you can imagine if it's you that that's, you know, that makes you feel much better, right? Um, so designing at that level of detail is very important to us. Um, so the agent interaction, and then also looking at uh, on the upper right is the tools that the agent is using um, in a process like this, or when they're receiving a call and understanding, okay, what's the... Uh, uh, designing a, a, an interface for agents so that um, uh, you know they have a workflow that walks them through very simply how to deal with these types of situations, and not so that they're like robots, but um, so so that it you know guides them so that they resolve that situation as best they can, um, so that we we feel good that when that interaction is done and and um, that that you know, they've done the best they can to recover well and that that member has, you know, a good memory of, well, yeah, I had, I had some challenges, but it went, you know, really, really spectacularly. So that's a very important um, part of our, our business as well on the design side. So just a, a recap, and then I'll open it up to um, questions. Uh, so great experiences drive loyalty, loyalty drives growth. It's a simple mantra. Um, we have design principles that we feel are fairly core to, to our uh, unique uh, business. You know, again, it's a very complex business, so we've tried to establish things that are uh, certainly applicable across industries but are, but are very core to what we do. Um, observing and understanding people and their behaviors uh, is you know, the core principle for us and, and both looking internally and, and externally, so not just your um, paying customers, if you will, looking at your internal customers and the, their experiences as well and designing their experiences uh, will impact, you know, your overall um, experience that, the, that your customer's getting. Understand and, and dissect journeys and those supporting processes. Design out your pain points, uh, define ideals, um, use data, um, and design experiences, not features. I didn't talk much about the data aspect, but we do also rely on our data, and that helps us, given the complex model that we're dealing with, and all this, there are so many interaction points, we, do, we use data to help us say, okay, here's an area where we really need to focus, because the data is telling us also that, you know, we're getting call volumes or, or, or that there's an opportunity. So we use data quite extensively. And then rinse and repeat. So, <laughs> so any um, questions? Yeah, thank you. I've got a mic here. Oh, okay. Following up on your last uh, point, rinse and repeat, given the complexity of an ongoing system, mm -hmm. then how long does it really take you to reconfigure this, or if you will, come out with the next release, given mm -hmm. all these touch points? And can you talk about some of the, the challenges once you've got an ongoing system that's pretty good, how mm -hmm. you optimize it? Yeah. So we, a um, couple of things to that. So first of all, we use an agile methodology. Um, so we do feel like it's very important to be um, constantly delivering 
value to the members. And so from a, from a design standpoint, what we'll try to do is um, uh, you know, periodically be releasing and addressing those new designs or updates. And um, for us, I think it's a combination of continuous improvement like looking at how can we continuously improve for people who are using the service today or in the next three months or in the next six months, while simultaneously looking a little bit more long term at how do you, are, are there designs based on what's happening in the industry and things like that and based on what's happening with how people are using car sharing, how can we design also to, you know, to leapfrog our, our, our service basically. So it's really, for us, like a, a simultaneous of continuous innovation and improvements and also looking long term. Mm -hmm. So one of the coolest things I, I've always found about the Zipcar service is that I have some skin in the game, so I need to keep the car clean. I have to fill it up when it's empty. I'm kind of a partner in the use of this car. I'm not mm -hmm. just renting it. Mm -hmm. But I've never been asked to drop it off at the garage for an oil change. Or do, there are certain things that obviously happen outside of the driver's purview, mm -hmm. but they magically are just the cars are always there. And I'm just wondering if you're, the user population you have, in many ways, I don't know if it's only a subset or everyone kind of gets this way, has a certain altruistic bent to say, "Sure, I'll help." Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how, if you how you leverage that, and if you leverage that mm -hmm. in ways to either do things with the car and with the service or maybe adjacent to the service? Because mm -hmm. it's not just about finding the car and using it. There's a community. And, and yeah, definitely. Um, I, mean, I mean, I think some of the ways in which, you know, we, it's a really great point and we definitely, you know, feel that way. We have a bunch of wizards who are walking around, by the way, changing the oil. I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> The, the way we really leverage the community, you know, on the operational side, again, the members are part of that operation, right? And so, um, you know, one area we really focus on is, you know, help, help us keep the car clean, for example. Um, so that's an area where, you know, we're trying to communicate that, communicate the benefits of it to the, to the next guy and, and to, you know, having a, a, a service that you'll want to use. And um, so in that way, you know, we're, we're communicating to that community about the things you can do to make it a stronger community, you know, like not smoking and things like that. Um, but we, I think if you're asking, like, are we using the members right now to do, do more of the deeper level operational things, you know, we're not doing that, but I, I think... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to say, wait, you're not changing your oil? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Come on. <laughs> uh, question over here. So, your team has done such a great job with um, the rental experience. What have you done about the, uh, the next phase, that pre owned vehicle experience? The pre owned vehicle experience. So, after it. Beyond the useful life for yeah. your pur for your purposes mm. for your members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's something that you know our operations team is obviously always looking at, and uh, um, revolutionizing that. That's a good question. I, I, you know, I think we 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 operate as any company. I think that you know has fleets of cars, and you know you look at. Um, auctions and things like that, uh, uh, what, to, what to do with, with those assets. So, but it's a good question. I can't say that we're revolutionizing, but I think it's a... Not yet. Not yet, yeah. Exactly. That's tomorrow. Exactly. Uh, to, to go back more to the, uh, the type of studies specifically that you're doing for the user interface, or the user experience, I'm sorry. Um, do you find, as you break down the different parts, as you were showing here, that there are uh, that you can quantify certain certain aspects of that where you can say, well, this has to happen in two minutes because it happens in two minutes and thirty seconds. We start losing people. And, you know, do you, with the data and with the observation, do you can you set certain targets and then say this this is the goal for 
for certain parts of the process? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, something like um, scanning into the car, for example, you know, there's a communication that happens and if that if that, if it takes too long, right, for the car for the lock to unlock, you know, that's a good example of something that was designed that that there's a certain period of time at which you know it must unlock. So yes, the answer is yes. And does, does that come from from your observation? Exactly. Yeah, and it, right. Exactly. There are a lot of perceptions. I think on, uh, and we had this when we were um, designing the 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 iPhone app and the. The, the unlock and lock functions. We, you know, watched people using it and, um, you know, unlocking and like watching, watching their phone and and you could, even though it only took a few seconds, it felt like, um, you know, it was longer because we didn't have a message there. And then we added a message like, I forget what it says, like, your your request is going to space and back. You know, so it was something, it's something that, exactly, exactly, so. Yeah, so um, I'm wondering if you have any good examples of in the past, um, things you've found from these activities that have fundamentally changed your business and operations model. And an example that I can think of um, that maybe you have heard of in your experiences or everyone I know who uses Zipcar doesn't understand why it can't have a model like uh, Hubway bikes where you can <laughs> drive it somewhere, leave it and just forget about it and not have to bring it back to the first place. Obviously there's balance loading and all the mm -hmm. you know, issues with that but it seems like uh, most people will be willing to you know, pay extra an hour in, in order to have that opportunity to not have to bring it back. Mm -hmm. um, but do you have any other examples of things you've done in the past where you might have changed your model like that? Well, I think you know, it's such a dynamic space right now. There's a lot happening in car sharing. And, and so we are constantly trying to you know, think about those things and, and think about you know, our plans relative to, to things like what you mentioned with the Hubway, Hubway bikes. Um, I'm trying to think of an example that's similar to that. Um, I can't, can you, I, not at the moment, but uh, certainly what we try to do is we're, we're trying to understand, you know, how people are using car sharing and, and understand trip types and decisions around trip types and trip needs and um, that, you know, that tends to spark different, different things, so. Actually, I think I might have a, a sort of an example. So we saw from uh, you know researching member usage that people wanted to be able to take a car overnight, but typically it was too expensive. Mm, actually, that's a good. And so now we offer like a special overnight rate. Yeah. Um, so it's not quite as uh, revolutionary or model busting as you're mentioning, but yeah. it's a little tweak that helps yeah. helps things out quite a bit. Yeah, and it it you know it fill it makes it easier to fill in a lower utilization period, right? Do you guys hear the particular example I gave? Um, just because I've heard it so often, people use it. Kind of oh, we don't, you know, we hit, members are um, asking us about the, that question, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, two things. One, the first is a suggestion for a simple change that I feel would improve the user experience. Uh, the first is, that when you do need to speak to a member services representative, you end up needing to dial about 15 or 16 digits to actually get to somebody because you need to enter the, the request, the user, uh, the card number, your birth date, and so on. And from the iPhone application, I think it would make sense that you could deep dial directly to the appropriate person and have they would have your information up front. That seems to be something that would really help people out. Um, so. The question part is, um, so I'm, I was interested in this service recovery paradox. It's not something I'd heard about before. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly agree with you for more serious events that that is a very positive experience when you come out feeling whole. But for the sort of more chronic, annoying events, uh, I, I think that may not be the case. Um, for instance, when a, a car is returned late and you're waiting there in the rain mm -hmm. uh, for the car, you know, the first time it happens and you get made whole, you feel great. But mm -hmm. it happens to me probably one in four, one in five times mm -hmm. when I rent a car. And it gets to be frustrating. So 
uh, what does your group do to sort of reduce the incidence of that beyond mm -hmm. just managing it? What do you do to reduce the incidence of that type of event? Mm -hmm. Do you want to address the first part? Sure. Well, I could, I could address both parts. Sure. Here. So uh, the first part is uh, we've made some changes to the IVR so that if your phone number is in your profile, you, I think two key presses to get to an agent. Uh, you can hit, I'm having a zip car emergency, and then choose your type of emergency. Uh, we are uh, going to be implementing deep dialing in our mobile app uh, upcoming this year. And then, um, I'm sorry, remind me in the second part of your question. Yes, so there's a number of things we're doing. One is updated alert types. So like, for example, um, you know, if you're out in your reservation, maybe when you made that booking, it was clear the rest of the day, right? But maybe soon before or during your reservation, you're not going to check, right? You're just going to assume that that time is free. But you know, if somebody books close after you, we should let you know so you can plan better and call us. Uh, another example is, you know, um, all of our cars have GPS in them, and so we can try to predict when people are going to be late, <coughs> and we call the next person and give them a heads up. No, we don't call the person in the car, at least yet. <laughs> because, you know, while we have this technology, we don't want to be too creepy about it. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, so we're calling the next person who might be the person who might be inconvenienced, and we say, hey, listen, we think this person might be late. Uh, do you want to move to a different car? Do you want to wait? Do you want to, you know, do something else? Um, and so there's a, you know, because we have such a multifaceted service, we're able to approach things from many different angles. So the, the and that is an area that we're very focused on. The the example that you you gave. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> So I have two questions, and they're so overlapping that I'll just ask them both, and you can decide <laughs> how to answer them. Um, in your research, what was the biggest surprise to you that you found about the way people use zip cars? Mm -hmm. And what was the biggest fight you had with your management about a change that needed to be made mm -hmm. based on your research that didn't seem mm -hmm. obvious? <laughs> um, the biggest finding, let's see, I think some big findings um, ha have to do with just the real reliance on the service. You know, we have stories of um, people who really, really, like they're, you know, they're, they had a family member who was sick and they needed to take them to cancer care on a weekly basis. That there were these stories of people who it was really you know their car and which which also made you know our job much more you know important in that okay well we need to be making sure that it's always there and it's ready to go and that that people were really relying on it so getting to the you know getting to that level of how people make it a part of their lives and how how they rely on it i think was a big learning um, Let's see, challenges with regards to change. You know, well, I think the, the um, accelerating maybe the iPhone app was one that um, was, it, it, it's not a contentious at all, but it, you know, we needed to make the case that it was a trend, an important trend. Um, it, you know, presented a lot of benefit to members and so, there's never a contention, but it's just make, making the case, and um, you know, which we typically do with with the research, and that's it's very powerful, right? It's very powerful. So, uh, I only have one question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, first, I wanted to say that it was it's really impressive how you've gotten a holistic approach of all the moving parts at Zipcar, and my question is. What what uh, I haven't seen this in many companies that they're really in that enlightened, and I'm wondering what barriers you might have run into through that that approach with the company and how you overcame them. Yeah, that's a really good question because when I joined, um, I joined as more of a product manager and more of a in a director in a diff in a more traditional role, and uh, uh, basically. 
then needed to you know make make the case that w this is a really complex service system and that um, we should really have people who are focused on experience and that's not that doesn't mean um, you know you're in you're in the technology group or you're in the marketing group uh, because when I joined actually I was in the marketing group and you know marketing has different objectives right so um, so I had to make the case that this was an important thing to focus on uh, and have it be separate because so that the, the, the team's objectives were just focused on making the experience better, not um, other metrics, right? What do you think was the key thing in making your case? Um, I think there were a couple of things. I relied on uh, external stories quite a bit, you know, telling how other organizations like Intuit and some others that have taken this approach how you know how they got from A to A to B? It enabled them to get from A to B. Um, uh, I, I, I think it was it was largely around you know an, an external approach and uh, um, just you know making that differentiation between business functions that had metrics and if you have certain metrics, you may not put the the experience at the at the top of your list, right? As far as things to change, and um, uh, we also engaged just some you know external perspectives on this. You know, I got external perspectives on it um, at the time, like Bruce Temkin and um, a few others, you know, who who could vouch and you know show the impact of this kind of organization, and that. You know, great companies have high lo levels of loyalty, and that that whole model of if you focus on the experience, then the loyalty should should come. You know, there's a lot out there to support support that. So, yeah, and but we're still working on that today. You know, today I think we've made a lot of progress in our organization. We act as the people who are always asking, well, what does this mean for the member? And and it, it took a while to get all the different functions asking that question as their top, you know, one or two questions. And now, um, you know, we're feeling pretty good that most functions ask that question, well, how will this impact the member? So, but it's definitely a, a process and we're still working on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I, I actually, I'm, I'm not a Zipcar member, um, but uh, some years ago I lived, I lived next to a Zipcar parking spot. Okay. And, and <laughs> um, we, you know, you, you talked a lot about the, you know, the internal and external, mm -hmm. you know, behaviors that you have to account for and deal with and, and sort of take care of all those people. How do you deal with people who aren't members, who don't work for you, but are affected by, well, I'll, I'll give you an, an example. Okay. This, this particular spot was, and, and maybe it's the placement of the spot, um, was, was in an alley that led to a number of parking spots for mm -hmm. a row of houses. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, maybe once every couple of weeks, the zip car was, was sort of parked askew and blocking. Mm -hmm. the, you mm -hmm. know, so mm -hmm. you end up calling to say, hey, I mean, actually, it was. It always ended up being moved mysteriously, though I never saw anyone, <laughs> yeah. someone move. Yeah. But I'm. I'm just sort of wondering. I'm sure there are other things like that that, yeah. that you guys have had to deal with. And yeah, with. and obviously we monitor things like that. So if we saw people calling on this same topic over and over again, right? We we look at all that very carefully. Um, it would cause us to go look at that location and assess the location and make some decisions about the location. Maybe the location is not, you know, we do, maybe it's not big enough, right? And it's, it, you know, you, because it's not big enough, you're forcing people to park, you know, in a weird way and things like that. So it's really a matter of um, monitoring issues and things that are coming in and deciding, you know, prioritizing which ones to focus on, but we have local teams that, if it was in Boston, the local team would then be alerted to listen. We're hearing this over and over again. Go check it out, and let's put a plan in place to resolve it. Just kind of follow. Um, you, know, you talked about sort of 
dealing with emergencies and you know, call center, you know, talking to people through issues with the internet or whatever. You have people that actually go out to the site. To, to, you mean to, to check the site? So like if or, someone has an accident or, or has a big issue, you know, have Yeah, we ha so we have, in each market, we have a local team. And so, uh, so that there are people who work in fleet and member services. So that local team, in the case where you need that hands-on interaction, uh, and, and you also need the local knowledge, too, just because people are driving around. It just, it, we want to have that local knowledge. Um, we have people in, in markets who who will go out and or who are available to you as you know a member in that local market for whatever the the, the thing is. Uh, two questions. I'll ask them one at a time. Uh, some companies like Hertz and also uh, some private you know personal car sharing you know is getting into into this sort of space. Can you comment on how you're competing and uh, and is price one of the uh, you know competing points? Yeah, so we're, you know, we largely view our um, competition as car ownership, basically. Uh, so that's, that's the segment that we're interested in. Um, people who are living in the city who either don't have cars and need ways to get around or maybe they feel they can save money by not having a second car. And so... That's really what we're striving for. We want Zipcar to be like a car you would own. You know that. So um, that's really our you know focus competitively. And I think you know on the price question, again, it all come, to us. It all comes back to um, really making it the best service possible. We're striving for that, right? You know that's why that's why we exist. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, but rather than you know being focused on the lowest price, delivering the best service and doing that over and over again, we believe that you know that's that's where we should focus. Also, can you comment on how uh, activities or operations may have changed during the period of time that you were not a public company and now that you are? Um, I don't think I can really speak to that, but you know I think you know um, it's. It's, it's, uh... Well, I would say that from my perspective, I, I joined right before the IPO and, you know, I've been here about a year and a half. But I would say from a fleet perspective, a fleet operations perspective, we're operating the same. You know, we're maintaining the cars, we're yeah. getting new cars. Do, if you are a member and have particular concerns afterwards, we're happy to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. I got one question. Um, you were mentioning before that you're looking at different personas, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you're also looking at tailoring experiences directed to persona types. Like, for example, someone who would like to go change oil or someone who likes mm -hmm. to go get gas, but another person would hate doing that, or reparking mm -hmm. a car, and how you would find out which person you're talking to. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we do look at that. Um, one, you know, one example is um, uh, when we were looking at um, uh, research around planning, trip planning, and um, the fact that once we observed all of these members, um, trip planning and trip management, I guess I'd call it. Once we observed all these members, it was clear that they they fell into, you know, personas, uh, such as, you know, and, uh, the over planner, right? <laughs> um, or, you know, the, the casual, I don't plan much. And so this was for a particular area of how people make, you know, decisions about their trip and how we can help them manage their trip. Um, but that was an example of there were clear personas around that particular decision-making process. So it is a very important aspect to, to what we do and understanding um, the different personas within that experience journey. And I, and I think you're right, you know, you'd have, um, we, we have segments of members who are really, really into the community and inter interacting with the community and very, you know, very active on our social media channels and things like that. And then we have, you know, segments of people who are just using the service and not necessarily. So there are definitely um, segments in that way. 
Hi. I am a librarian, and I totally get the service recovery paradox. I'm oh, glad good. it has a name. Okay. The, the mess ups and the problems and the having to tell people no gives you a wonderful opportunity to connect with them in a positive way if mm -hmm. you do it right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I totally get that. It also shows you where the problems are and what you need to design mm -hmm. around. At least that's what it did for me. So that's my comment. My question is, Zipcar is multimodal transit, um, mm -hmm. you know, like taking the bus, mm -hmm. except smaller. How do you pick your parking spaces to mm -hmm. do this well? How does that work? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, there are a lot of dynamics around securing parking um, you know one is just looking at looking at the city and um, looking at <clears throat> the um, the population of the city and demographics and things like that um, the other is just the city themselves and working with the city um, to because oftentimes you know the parking sp spots may or may not be public or private and so it's also has to do with the relationships that you develop um, either with you know parking garage owners or the city and um, so that can have a lot of impact on where you also put put spots but it's largely based on you know we look at we look at how people are using the service and you can you know we can see for example you know we've um, we've added cars recently in Salem or we just added cars in um, P-Town right so just looking at the dynamics of <clears throat> you know how people are using the service and you know do people want um, to use Zipcar on commuter lines and things like that and so um, experimenting with places outside of the the circum because I live in East Arlington and they're all walk to yeah exactly. spots but I, yeah. I so but what know, other ones do you three have three years ago you, we probably we didn't have that many in East Arlington, mm -hmm. you know, and so as the as the customer base grows, we, that's the nice thing that we can fund more cars, right? So, um, <clears throat> I wonder now that you have a lot of data, that you said you are very database. I'm just wondering at what point do you allow for almost that taking on the individual preferences to for the experience to be really almost individualized yeah. on on the individual preference. Yeah, yeah. One of the case you mentioned, for instance, that maybe some driver would like you to remind them you are half an hour. Yes. Uh, that kind of thing that well, mm -hmm. others would want that. Then that kind of thing. Do you go into really individual preferences and in that design? Yeah, I think that you know, I think that's an area that we're scratching the surface of, um, and I, I do think it's um, a, a big area of opportunity. Um, we do some of that where you know we ask you what your preferred locations are to reserve and um, preferred vehicles, things like that. Um, and, and so then we're more proactive with that information. But I think it's, a, it's actually a huge opportunity to really look at the data and, and be able to take the service up, up another notch because of that, that information. So it's a, it's a huge thing that, that's important to us to, to look at. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, how do you guys research the rule breakers and the outlaws that are using the service? Like with the people that really, because it's hard to, I imagine it's hard to do a sit along with somebody that is totally breaking all the rules because you're watching them. Yeah. And, and if, as anything that's been bad emerged as a good behavior that you somehow co opted into the service? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and obviously, you know, something that we're always looking at. Part of that is um, in the beginning, you know, the, the eligibility and the screening that goes on for you to become a member and making sure you know you have to have a fairly clean driving record and all that so so there's some things that we do in the beginning to make sh you know try, try to ensure that the people that are joining the service are don't have a high high likelihood of that kind of behavior um, but as you suspect that doesn't always happen um, and so again we we look at all that information right and so um, if you return the car late, you know, 10 times and you haven't called or, you know, what we try to do is investigate, you know, patterns and why that's happening and, um, 
sometimes we find that it's, it's not the member, but it's the, the service system, right? And, and so it's not you, it's us, and we need to um, you know, design something better so that you know, you, you're not facing that problem. Um, but sometimes there are, you know, repeat behaviors and um, that we have to address. And, um, and like something even benign as letting another driver use the car. That's yeah. Not yeah. Shirt, but that probably happens quite often. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we have, you know, we have policies and uh, and things that when you're joining the service, we state all those things. We try to state all those things. Um, so we, you know, we hope that people will abide by them. But there are things, you know, we can't always tell, so. Um, but it is, it's, it's also the other complexity part is just always looking at those policies. Policies, you know, are they doing what they're supposed to do? Are they fair? So there are a lot of dynamics, even just we spend a lot of time looking at the policies that we have. Um, and it is all, it's all based on, you know, what we're seeing with regards to how people are using the service. And A question going back to your slide. Uh, what's your process of triaging and prioritizing ideas and uh, complaints from the customer service group? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, do you want to speak to that, Todd, or you want to? So uh, are you talking directly from, like, say, the member service representatives or from the members? Customers, might, yeah, members might okay. call uh, the customer service. It could be internal associates ideas. Yeah. You know? yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we get a lot of ideas, whether it's from employees. We have, I think, around, what, 600 employees or so now mm -hmm. spread out throughout the, the country at our different offices, and they have a lot of direct contact with members, whether it's, uh, you know, helping them out when they come into our offices or calling up or emailing us. And depending on the idea, you know, some things are quite actionable and some things aren't. Like someone's like, I live out in Great Barrington and I want zip cars there. Well, that's likely not going to happen. But uh, a lot of things, uh, you know, can form into patterns. And so it's our job to kind of detect where those patterns are lying. And we might see the same sort of thing uh, bubbling up through multiple channels. So say we might see, you know, um, uh, we're talking about uh, late returns before, right? And how do we, how do we manage that? Well, I was looking at some data of uh, reservation history and I noticed that when a car was moved from one location to another, the percentage of times it was returned late doubled. You know, and that combined with uh, uh, tickets in the, in our, I forget where the gentleman was who lived next to the zip car location before, but uh, you know, looking at that location and looking at tickets that were either called in about it or, or emailed about it, you know, we determined that was a bad location. And so that's a very tactical issue that we resolved and so that was a bad location so we got rid of it. But you know, it, it, we take the same pattern. So we might see, you know, if we're seeing, um, you know, say we have a new policy, right, and it doesn't go as well as we, the, you know, the reception isn't as good as we might like, you know, we can monitor that through social media, through feedback from members uh, directly, through like focus groups or um, usability studies for some things. But um, in terms of, you know, prioritizing amongst all the other things and finding out what we solve, you know, I, I think it, it's similar to how it happens at other companies. You know, we look at, you know, what's the effort going to be to fix this? How many people is this affecting? Who's it affecting? Um, what's the severity? Is it something like there's a pole in the parking lot where people are backing into all the time? Or is it something like, uh, you know, people keep forgetting the sunglasses in the car? And so, you know, we look at the severity of things as well. Um, we also and, do, and you know, surveys af after your reservation, and so we're co we're constantly getting feedback from the members, uh, and and looking at the Pareto basically of okay, what are what are the main things that we need to address, or so. Mm -hmm. Hi, I just want to follow up on some previous questions, and the one was around the personas and the segments that you were talking about. Um, just bringing it to our local area, Boston, Cambridge, what are some of those segments that are the more loyal? Yep. 
Um, and then the other question was around, um, you were talking about the parking spaces in the city and availability. Um, and there's something that's new in the news I heard recently about um, Boston, I think it was, I don't know if it was specifically to the south end, where um, the city is looking at turning spaces like parking into more green space that mm -hmm. communities can use. Um, has that sort of come, bubbled up yet to your Yeah, so on, on, the, um, on the first one with regards to segments and loyalty and, uh, you know, we see that, for example, urban professionals are, um, you know, highly reliant on the service and, um, you know, we also see younger demographics that are, you know, there are, as you know, there are all these trends of younger demographics are not necessarily saying that they need to buy a car, you know, it's not, exactly, and, and so that is a, um, it's a very different segment in that they're, they're not buying cars, they're going right to car sharing, right? And so they're very loyal to car sharing because that's what they know. Um, and I think, you know, and just the, the urban professional also, people who are really living and working in the city and know that it's very expensive to own a car and pay for parking and insurance and things like that. And, uh, and then on the green parking, um, you know, certainly the, the, the green theme is important to us. You know, we're testing um, uh, electric vehicles, things like that. And so, um, you know, it's, I, I don't know that one specifically, but it's definitely an area that we're involved in many different cities, Seattle, Portland, some others. Exactly, exactly. And that's another re reason why, you know, we have people at the local level as well who are, you know, really developing relationships with the cities and understanding the development that's happening in the cities. And, you know, we do look at uh, the, the development that's going on and, and um, try to engage, you know, in those conversations. All right. Uh, we have a last question. Sure. Oh. So given, <coughs> sorry. sorry, given how much companies fail at basic user observation of their customers, and you're obviously doing a fair amount of it, yet you also have many different segments, lots of geographies, lots of markets, lots of cultures, lots of different places that you are involved. Have you found some highly cost-effective way to do field observation, or is it just that you already have people in market, or sort of how do you manage to sustain a fair amount of field research that, that many companies just completely fail to even dip their toe into? Yeah, I think it is uh, getting, what is nice is that we do have people in the local markets, um, and so we you know try to get them involved where possible um, and get them trained up on these things. and. Um, and then also we, you know, as a team, try to um, periodically um, be going to those markets, you know, so kind of dividing and conquering. Um, but I think it's really using the network of people in the company. And, and, you know, to your point earlier, the fact that we were able to build this organization kind of from scratch and get... <clears throat> get other people in the organization excited about why it's important to focus on experience. It's really easy for us to recruit people in our own company to participate in our projects. <laughs> so we're always engaging people from other functions and they learn a lot. You know, we had the COO, for example, did a ride along with, you know, a member and, you know, so we really try to get everyone involved. I think you had, there was one, I felt bad because I was pointing at it kind of goes along with the um, observational work, mm -hmm. and uh, it's kind of a two-part question. First, have you, under certain kinds of customer experience redesigns, have you actually applied experimental method and done kind of like A-B testing of a change in experience? And mm -hmm. Do you pay attention? I'm curious how you do that. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece is you have a unique opportunity now to look at not only regional, but maybe starting to see global variations in mm. people's perception of customer experience and how do you leverage that data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do um, A-B testing, um, mostly on the web right now, uh, but we definitely do that and um, you know incorporate that thing, like things, um, like with the plans that people are selecting, you know, looking at different things or looking at different, um, 
designs of interactions. One simple one that we did recently was um, people who don't aren't opted into text alerts, for example. There, there's a great benefit to opting into text alerts because you get a, the service is better and um, you can get you know a, a, an alert that says you need to um, extend your reservation. So we did different you know treatments basically. So we we a B test at the treatment level on the on the web. Um, uh, yeah, and then I'm sorry. The, the, the regional variation. Oh, the regional variation. Yeah, so that's th that. As you mentioned, that's a, a big thing that's now developed. We're in London. Um, you know, uh, understanding the different nuances and at the country level is very important. There's certainly fundamental components of the experience that are going to transfer over, but understanding the different nuances. Um, are very important to us, you know. So, for example, in London, um, you know the the dynamics of um, the, the even the traffic and the differences in transportation options. You know, it's there's it's amazing over there, and so people use the service slightly differently, at, meaning at different you know maybe different times and things like that. So there are definitely those elements to look at. Globally, but do you know do so at the country level? We think that's important. You know, we don't want to go launching in these cities and say, "Oh, well, what we're doing here is going to work." I, I think I think we have a good sense that we need to really understand the nuances of a, a particular country and city because they're all so different and dynamic, and then design around around those nuances. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much.